Dear Tabi, uh, this is my honor to have a talk in this global seminar series. So I'm Koji Fujita from Nagoya University, Japan. So in this presentation, I talk about how had been the Himalayan glaciology uh, developed uh, by my senior colleagues when they are young students. Another part of this talk, I present how have I measured Himalayan glaciers for the last three decades. So in the early 1970s, a working group of, for glacier study was formed by many PhD students with a few professors. Uh, they belong to Nagoya University, Kyoto University, and Hokkaido universities. Common attribute of these guys are uh, a member of University Alpine Club. So it means that their motivation to study Himalayan glaciers is going to the Himalaya anyway, rather than pure science. So the working group had many brainstorming meetings and listed up issues should be tackled about Himalayan glaciers. They published a report, we call it Booklet in Blue, and they named their activities as Glaciological Expedition of Nepal, GAN. The issues listed up ranged various topics, glacier inventory, monsoon climate, debris covered glacier, ice core research, glacier fluctuation, and glacier mass balance. These issues are still hot topics nowadays. So I briefly show some activities on these topics. This is a map showing glaciers and the river basin in the booklet in blue. In the 1970s, our knowledge on glaciers was so limited that we can see only few dozens of glaciers here. In the GEN activity, a PhD student, Mr. Nagoshi, has painted glacier, debris covered area, and moraine and then topographical features on the one inch, one mile map made in India for the entire Nepal Himalaya. I don't know how they obtained such a restricted and classified maps from somewhere. Unfortunately, uh, we, we call this Nagoshi map. Unfortunately, this map, uh, these maps are not published so far, and these are stored in the map case of our laboratory yet. Gen created only one Grisha inventory for the Dudukoshi River Basin, including Kumbu region and Mount Everest. Four decades later, Akiko Sakai and her team completed Gundam Glacier Inventory covering the entire high mountain area. Gen conducted a bunch of chartering flight for shooting aerial photographs for the Nepal Himalaya. All photographs more than 12,000 were di digitized and archived by my uh, colleague uh, 10 years ago. These, uh, these photographs have been just photographs so far, but we recently realized that there are huge potential to be uh, studied through the SFM technique, surface from motion. Three decades later, in 2007, we collaborated with Asahi Shimbun, a newspaper company in Japan, for taking aerial photographs and then capture the changes in Himalayan glaciers and the glacial lake. Gen established Hajun Meteorological Station in Kumbu region nearby Mount Everest. At that time, there was no automatic recorder so, so that a few students and then Sherpa guys stayed at and 
maintained the station for three years from 1974 to 1976. In the recent few decades, many Research groups are learning metallurgical stations and instruments along the Himalayan range. One of the most famous sites is Pyramid Station, established by Italian researchers around, uh, around here. In the Himalayas, understanding of debris covered glacier is a key issue nowadays. The first observation of Himalayan debris covered glacier was conducted at Kumbu Glacier in 1978. As a geomorphological survey, uh, they recreated detailed fine scale map uh, like this of debris covered area by their intensive survey. Gen also conducted ice core drawing at high elevation of Himalaya. They tested many types of mechanical drill, this one and this one, uh, and took two ice cores from a glacier. They improved their drill and then contributed to the deep ice core drawing at Tomo Fuji in Antarctica, the two decades later from this drilling. Through the operation, they found that the glacier had an in, inverse thermal structure called uh, at lower elevation and temperate at higher elevations. One PhD a student worked on the thermal issues, but before he published his PhD thesis, Prata and Futa published a famous paper on some, uh, polythermal glacier in Svalbard in Journal of Glaciology in 1991. But still, uh, we recognize that uh, polythermal glacier uh, exists in Himalaya too. This glacier is the first birthplace of cryobiology, which was presented by Nozomu Takeuchi two weeks ago in the seminar series. Gain activity had published as a series of special issue of Journal of Japanese Society of Snow and Ice and other uh, proceedings. Since then, the Himalayan glaciology have continued. So from now on, I talk about my activities. I joined the glaciological community in 1992. So this is my self-introduction. My main part of my life uh, in early days consists of climbing. I belong to Kyoto University Alpine Club and then Tokai Alpine Club in Nagoya. And I have enjoyed rock and snow climbing so far. Uh, but the recent decade, I am enjoying indoor climbing only. This is my first experience of a glacier. I joined a mountain expedition when I was 20 years old boy and visited Western China, uh, Mustagata here. It is difficult to express my uh, by words, but way of my life was surely changed when I saw this scenery. In the next year, 1990s, I climbed Shishapama and watched the Himalayan view from 8,000 meters. Through these experiences, I wonder if I can keep a relationship with the glaciers and the Himalaya, and then joined the Cryosphere Research Laboratory of Nagoya University as a graduate student since 1992. Since then, I have spent more than five years in the glacier fields during three decades. The cycle size uh, here is shown uh, is how much, how many times I visited glaciers, and then color depth is how many months I stayed there. 
uh, mainly in the uh, Nepal and the Bhutan Himalaya, but also Tibet and then uh, Central Asia. I visited also uh, Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, <coughs> but as you know, uh, we have no chance to visit Grisha for the last two years. It's so frustrating to everyone. So for the latter part of this presentation, I talk, I talk how I measure changes in Himalayan glaciers. Mainly talk about uh, Hitun Valley in Nepal Himalaya and the Dunana region in Buddha Himalaya. First, I talk about Hitun Valley in Nepal and uh, how our observation method have changed for the last almost five decades, including gang activity. Hidden Valley is located in Western Nepal. The valley was found and named by a French expedition which made the first ascent of Mount Annapurna, the first 8,000 meter peak climbed in 1950. The gang team consisted of two PhD student here and here, and one Nepali counterpart. They stayed at the valley for four months in 1974, and then conducted meteorological observation and glaciological observation, and so on. The team installed several stakes about uh, along five survey lines. A, B, C, D, and E. And the stakes were used for mass balance and the flow velocity measurement. They had sealed light without distance finder at that time. So they have to move, uh, <coughs> they have to move their sealed light point by point like this, this animation. Uh, in a what, measuring one system. Uh, <coughs> they had no walkie talkie too, so that just I had uh, they to keep straight line along the survey line, they communicated by flag. 20 years later, from the first game observation, I visited the valley with one game member who became professor. Having the left of picture in my hand, here this one, <coughs> I walked around the terminus to find the place this picture taken. And then when I stood in front of this glacier, I was so excited to see that this glacier surely retreated for the last two decades at that time. In the 1990s, the global warming and then glacier shrinkage were not concerned seriously, and then no one knows that what is happening on Himalayan glaciers. We had a updated satellite uh, with laser distance finder. This here, so it is not. It was not necessary to move on glacier, just. One only one person, it's me, uh, <coughs> walked on the glacier. For the comparison, I salvaged the raw data of the 1974 survey from the, their original field note and then calculated uh, <coughs> not only the stake position, but also all survey positions, and then compare with our measurement. We also measure the <coughs> uh, ice thickness by ice layer. Coincidentally, a research team from United States of America has visited this glacier one month earlier than us. It was a race of publication, and then we know the uh, case of uh, in polysomal glacier, so that we are hurry in 
uh, we are hurry to analyze and publish our paper, uh, data. In the 1990s, however, the submission system was quite different from today. We have to send three hard copies of the double spacing manuscript by airmail. It's a huge amount of airmail. And the communication was done uh, through faxmail or airmail. And my manuscript has been ignored for more than six months. <clears throat> I couldn't ask to uh, and or remind the editor due to my feedbacks in the next succeeding years. Finally, Doug McCall, who had Seligman's speech last week, rescued this study. I appreciate his support. This was the first study evaluated volume change of Himalayan glacier. Anyway, <clears throat> we recognized the Hidden Valley is one of the best locations to study glaciers because we can access to the high accumulation zone around 6,000 meters. Other Himalayan glaciers have a, a steep ice pole so that we cannot access easily. So we revisited the valley again and then conducted measurement of direct mass balance and flow velocity <coughs> using our uh, <coughs> theodolite with distance finder. <coughs> we also drew a nice score <coughs> excuse me, at the upper accumulation zone uh, here, uh, looking at the Daulagiri, the eighth uh, highest mountain in the world, and then brought uh, the ice core to Japan in the frozen state. This is the first time. During the <coughs> observation, we witnessed many flocks of birds crossing the Himalaya. All observations have been conducted by students. This is Nozomu Takeuchi, and he had a seminar in, uh, two weeks ago. During the observations in the valley, with our soft nice, but at that descending, we had heavy snowfalls, both 1998 and 1999. It was so scary that we lost our route and the senses of balance and direction. Fortunately, no one was lost or killed. We have no photograph of whiteout. Such a snow, heavy snowfall frequently did not allow us to access the valley. Ten years later, in 2009, we revisited the valley to conduct geodetic survey with our new GPS system. But we couldn't enter the valley due to this scenery, heavy snow cover. We tried again six months later, 2010, and then success to get in there. We worked on the glacier intensively, as shown by dead tracks, GPS tracks. Blue point along the center line of <coughs> glacier, a stake location in 1999, 10 years ago. So on the real glacier, there is no mark, <coughs> of course, so that we uh, set this, this location in our handy GPS. And then considering the GPS uncertainty, we walked around the stake position like this figure. Then, we could evaluate geodetic mass balance of three Himalayan glacier, including Rikasamba glacier. At this time, an um, <coughs> incorrect description in IPCC AR4 about Himalayan glacier was a big scandal so that we could provide the ground truth from the uh, 
uh, ground-based observation by our study. On the other hand, it is difficult for us Japanese to visit the valley and maintain the observation network every year. I handed over the monitoring task to Isimodo in Kathmandu. Their glacier monitoring project has been funded by Norwegian government for more than 10 years, <coughs> and they have uh, conducted regular measurements of two glaciers in Nepal, Rikasamba Glacier in the Hidden Valley and the Yara Glacier in Lantan Valley. Last year, they published the mass balance data of direct measurement. <coughs> and then this is this line looks inclined, but uh, I confirmed these are uh, all uh, lines are parallel. In 2019, uh, nine years later of my previous visit, I had, I had a nice opportunity to collaborate with the Ishimoto team. We spent uh, several days in the valley under not so clear weather, but we measured uh, mass balance stakes, maintained the stakes, and uh, we installed automatic weather station nearby glacier. Uh, also, we couldn't visit the glacier for the last two e years due to COVID-19, but Ish the Ishimoto team revisited the valley last year and they found that their <coughs> stakes, uh, uh, only a few stakes were lost for the last two years. The Isimodo team also supported our another observation site in Lorwarin region in Nepal Himalaya. I appreciate it. At last, we can compare the same quality of data, GPS versus GPS. The red circle here, <coughs> uh, the mass band stakes maintained by Isimoto Group T. Here is the GPS tracks in 2010. We walked widely as possible for the future <coughs> survey. Then in 2019, we just woke up and down along the stakes, but we could find the many cross points uh, between the two uh, <coughs> nine years. Then we can calculate elevation change on and off glaciers like this. Elevation change off glacier here can be used for the validation of the measurement. And then we can find some changes in terrain along uh, beside the glacier. About glacier change, we can see the retreat of the terminus here and the acceleration of <coughs> sending rate over the abrasion zone and then unchanged accumulation area for the last decade. So this result will be uh, now in prepar preparation uh, by my Nepali colleagues. So in the next, I talk about our field work in Bhutan Himalaya. In the lunar region of Bhutan, we have investigated glacier and glacier lake issues, especially on glacier lake outburst flat, uh, growth, we call growth hazard. In this region, we can see various kinds of glacier terminals, as picture shows. Some glaciers have already developed glacier lake like this, some glacial lake is now developing, and some has no glacial lake yet. So here is one of the best places to investigate interaction between glacial lake and glaciers. 
but this Lunana region is so isolated from the uh, village town. We need more than 400 kilometer trekking for one and a half month, but we can only use one week to get uh, data actually. In addition, sometimes our observation was affected by the environmental variability. I mean, one year, we couldn't get uh, local support because all villagers went out to get the, this caterpillar fungus. In Japanese and Chinese character, it means uh, warm during winter time, turn into grass in summer. This is a very expensive medicine in China, so that this income, the income by selling it, this it is much higher than our offer for Porta job. So at that time, no one help us. So we have to bring our camp camping and food stuff and observational instrument by ourselves. Anyway, we have conducted the same GPS survey uh, as Hidden Valley and then on two neighboring glaciers. Totomi and Duge Glacier. Totomi Glacier has multiple ponds or becoming lake. They have been formed uh, into one lake at that time. And then, but Duge Glacier Lake have been already developed in, in the 1960s. And then this lake outburst flood occurred in 1994. That's why we uh, <coughs> did the glacial uh, research, glacial lake. So by our repeated survey in uh, 2004 and 2011, we evaluated thinning rate of two glaciers like this, this colored point, uh, GPS tracks, and the changes in surface elevation. The thinning <coughs> Thinning rate are so contrasted. Lake terminating Luge Glacier has been thinning much faster than land terminating Totomi Glacier here. This <coughs> measurement uh, data are much more accurate than remote sensing data, I think. Global states. This is differs are analyzed uh, by remote sensing data, are uh, also contrasted. Land terminating Totomi Glacier is slowing down towards uh, its terminus, while lake terminating Luge Glacier is speeding up towards its terminus. It's clearly different. So by simulating a glacial dynamics within the model, we can see the land terminating Totomi glacier as a compressive uh, <coughs> regime and then sustain the surface lowering by uplifting vertical motion we call uh, emergence velocity. On the other hand, extensional regime of Luge glacier accelerated the surface lowering by itself. This is well known as dynamic thinning. <coughs> Using the model, uh, we performed sensitivity experiment. If Totomi pond integrated into a large progression lake and, the found, and the found that the flow regime would turn into extensional regime, from a uh, compress compressive regime, and then thinning rate and, uh, would drastically increase. Of course, uh, <coughs> flow regime also changed from slowing down toward uh, speeding up. On the other hand, if Luge Glacier uh, was land-terminating <coughs> condition, 
So, flow regime uh, should be uh, should have been a compressive regime. During our observation, yes, survey in twenty eleven. The pond integration was occurring actually. This photograph taken at this point of Totomi Glacier, uh, two pond pond, almost lake, uh, <coughs> right bank lake and uh, left bank pond, already connected at this point, and then crossing the location here was so scary because we can see the lock, but we don't know uh, whether these rocks are stable or are just floating because behind these uh, <coughs> blocks are all icebergs. So we realized that it was the last opportunity to access to the total migration surface or up glacial ground. So, so for checking our projection uh, in 2018, we conducted aerial photogrammetry by only one national helicopter available in Bhutan. We attached the GPS and then camera and then took picture, a bunch of pictures and then created uh, also mosaic and then digital elevation model. So we can do the time for uh, checking the answer. Here is a <coughs> surface elevation change rate uh, for Totomi and then Luge glaciers. With a previous study, sending rate before 2000 were rather stable for Totomi. And then uh, we have slight uh, thinning light of Luge Glacier. After 2000, thinning light have been accelerated in both glaciers. Two remote sensing studies and uh, our GPS survey consist each other. This data. Then, after the progressional lake formed in front of Totomi Glacier here, the sending rate dr drastically accelerated while that of Luge Glacier seems constant. In before two, uh, 2011, <coughs> uh, sending rate is always much faster than Totomi Glacier, but after 2011, the sending rate of Totomi Glacier faster than Luge Glacier. So flow velocity of Totomi Glacier was, uh, has also changed drastically. Before 2011, the flow velocity slowing down towards the terminus, but in <coughs> flow velocity uh, analyzed for the uh, 2016 to 17s, so it's accelerated toward the terminus, which is much faster than our simulation. So there is only com <coughs> comparison between the land. <coughs> On the other hand, sorry, uh, flow velocity, flow of uh, Luge Glacier was same as before. It doesn't change so much. There are many comparisons between land terminating and lake terminating glaciers so far by remote sensing study. But this is the first evidence of terminus type transition from land to lake of a single glacier. This study was inspired in the field when I crossing this point. So I would finish my talk. So I have no strong uh, take home message, but 
Himalayan glaciology has been launched by Japanese former young students. And uh, we, uh, we got many in inspired uh, new ideas from the fieldwork. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much indeed. So are there any um, questions for Koji? So the way that we normally do this is uh, we ask people to indicate in the chat if they have a question and then we ask you to unmute to actually um, ask a question to Koji. I'll also have a look on Facebook to see if there are any questions there. Um, that's an inspirationally large number of aerial photographs that were available. I guess a real program of um, differencing volume changes over very large areas could be undertaken. Is that, is that something that you're, you're doing already, Koji? You mean this? There were two sets of aerial photographs, at least, that you showed us. Uh -huh. um, I, um, I was wondering whether you have been able to make DEMs from them. You mentioned um, structure through motion, but I wondered whether you'd sort of done very large scale DEMs and looked at the diff volume differences. Yeah. Then and again, there was a, a later epoch, wasn't there? Yes, exactly. Uh, with many yeah, my, photographs. Yes. My PhD students, some PhD students struggling these issues, but uh, uh, still difficult to direct comparison because in the uh, aerial photographs in by GEM 1970s, they took pictures by film camera. So that uh, at that time, so film, is so expensive so that uh, <clears throat> they didn't took picture, say overlapping pictures. So that uh, say area we can establish, uh, we can make DM is so limited. I saw some study uh, used this, this archive uh, by, <coughs> and to compare the elevation change in Kumbu Glacier, but uh, actually not, not yet. So large scale uh, DEM is not created yet. That's interesting to know. So even the second epoch were not uh, stereo um, photographs. Is, is that right? Or was it just the earlier ones that were not stereo? And then <coughs> for about this photograph set taken uh, 2007. At that time, we used a uh, digital camera and the whole photographs were shared with Asashimu newspaper company so that <coughs> we can create some uh, digital elevation model. So, glacier by <coughs> study by study, uh, we used this data set to create uh, also mosaic and then digital elevation model. I don't, oh, sorry, I, I have no slide, but uh, yes, uh, we created some data set from these photographs. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Paco, I think you have a question. Uh, yes, I have a question, but uh, also I have a comment, is that I am not surprised that you decided to go for glaciology after watching this nice uh, picture that you have shown of this, I don't remember exactly the name, I think it was Muztag Atta, the first one that you visited. It was really impressive, uh, these uh, huge blocks of uh, ice and these huge crevasses. So it's not, yeah, that one, Muztag Atta. So I'm not surprised that you decided to go for glaciology. I would have done the same after that. Uh, I have a question, but it's not uh, on science, but on funding. You have done so many uh, expeditions during so long period of time that I'm just curious to know whether all of this was with uh, national funding or state funding was also with uh, maybe some kind of private funding or um, what were your main sources of funding this uh, huge amount of uh, field work? Thank you for the question. Uh, 
basically this uh how to say uh series of expedition was funded by Japanese government. Uh, but interestingly, in the 19, 1970s, the government does not allow to use the funded money to students. The Japanese government thought that uh, uh, research work should be done by researchers having permanent post. Student is just student. <laughs> they, they should learn the uh, science, but not, they cannot help the research work. So that the student, this, these young guys should uh, get their own money for accommodation, food stuff, and travel by themselves uh, through the uh, part-time job in Japan. But when I joined this community, 1990s, the uh, situation was improved so much so that uh, uh, funded money can be used for student accommodation and travel. So that, uh, and then anyway, so all these observations have been funded by government. Okay, okay, thanks. And congratulations for nice, uh, really nice talk and history of research of this really beautiful uh, region. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, Roger, I think you have a question or a comment or something that's halfway between the two. Thank you, Tavi. Yes, a, a bit of both. And thank you, Koji, very much for the talk. I'm impressed by your determination in keeping on with uh, studying this area. Um, the area feels to me to be somewhat politically sensitive from, from my own experience of trying to do geosciences in the Himalayas. And um, I wonder if you've got any, uh, any recollections of your, uh, of your predecessors or, or your own experiences in how difficult it was to get access to these areas. We, we've had funded geos, geoscience projects in these areas um, and they've always been turned down because of political military sensitivities, but I guess we were doing things like seismic and gravity, whereas yours is more obviously for the, for the good of the world, I guess. But thank, thank thanks you again very much for the talk. Thank you for the question. And then, um, yeah, this, this is uh, happened in this expedition in 1974. So original plan, they uh, wanted to stay the hidden valley for more than six months. But uh, some have say uh, very has said, excuse me. <coughs> so Um, I'll say uh, convolution uh, in happen in the Tibetan side, so that uh, they have to uh, quit from the body in that time. But for our activity since 1990s, uh, we did not affect it such a uh, political situation, uh, but. Uh, I remember that one issues uh, in 2008, we tried to access the Bhutan Himalaya from the uh, Tibetan, Tibetan side, but the local police uh, did not allow us to enter the mountain because some uh, Tibetan people escaped crossing the border, uh, the area we are going to. So that sometimes uh, we, affect, we are affected such a political situation, but not seriously from at this moment. Yeah. Smashing, thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any further questions for uh, Koji? 
Um, okay, so uh, it um, then falls on to my, me to introduce next week's seminar, uh, which is three early career researchers talking. So I hope to see everyone there. So a huge thank you to Koji and also very best of luck getting back uh, into the field um, and back to your glaciers. You said you haven't been there for two years. So uh, fingers crossed that that changes for yourself very soon and you get back to visit the glaciers again. I hope so. So thank you very much to everyone and see you all next week. Thank you everyone.